The ground we stand on accounts for only 30% of the Earth's surface. So what about the rest? Well, that other 70% is our world ocean, which to many of us land dwellers may seem like a foreign concept, an intangible body of water largely separated from our day-to-day -day lives. But in reality, the ocean is the one common link that connects us all. The food we eat, the air we breathe, the storms we ride, and the economies we build are all dependent on our world ocean. On this podcast, we will dive into emerging markets, innovative technology, and conservation efforts to shed light on the ocean, the other 70%, that enables us to have a footprint, a home, and a life on Earth. The other 70% is brought to you by Nortec. As ocean enthusiasts, researchers, and technologists, we are on a mission to make an impact through innovation, exploration, and activism above and below the surface. Help keep us exploring by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. Welcome back to the other 70%, everyone. I am your host, Nevin DeParlo, and today we will be discussing a very exciting company called Blue Latitudes. Blue Latitude's story began when co-founders Emily Hazelwood and Amber Sparks met in grad school at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. The pair saw an opportunity to open new doors in the ocean conservation world by working with oil and gas companies rather than against them. In 2015, Blue Latitudes was born with the major mission of taking decommissioned offshore oil rigs and turning the structures into artificial coral reefs. In working in this field, Emily and Amber realized the need for increasing public awareness of the importance of healthy oceans and promoting ocean stewardship, prompting them to also create a nonprofit organization called the Blue Latitudes Foundation. On this episode of The Other 70%, Emily Hazelwood and Amber Sparks discuss the importance of finding innovative ocean conservation solutions, increasing public awareness and understanding of our oceans, and what motivates them to continually learn and work towards the health of our ocean and planet. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I think that you will too. So without further ado, let's dive into today's show. Amber and Emily, welcome to the other 70%. Thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to, to start things off, I think for our audience, it would be really helpful to just hear a little bit on each of your individual backgrounds and maybe also how you met and what, what sort of pushed you to start Blue Latitudes. Well, we have very different backgrounds, but you'll see in our story that they ended up being very compatible with one another. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire and I went to school at Connecticut college and got my degree in environmental science. Um, after my undergraduate degree, I had the opportunity to go work on the BP oil spill as a field tech. Um, and it was during that time, that was the first time I ever saw an oil platform. It was the first time I've ever been, you know, really out of the small area of New Hampshire to work. Um, and it was my first time getting experience in the field. So during that time, we were doing biota sampling, water sampling, sediment sampling, and um, just to basically understand the full extent and impact of the oil spill. Um, during that time, BP had hired many of the fishermen who had lost their jobs because of the spill to um, drive our sampling boats around. And they would just talk about how they couldn't wait to go fishing on these platforms. Um, on the weekends, which at the time just seemed bizarre because here we are cleaning up, you know, this oil spill and working on this oil spill that was caused by one of these oil platforms. And yet these fishermen saying they can't wait to go fish on them. So it, to me, it was just bizarre. And it was the first time that I learned about the Rakes to Reefs program um, and kind of intrigued me. And I, you know, started to learn about the relationship that the people in the Gulf of Mexico have with these offshore oil platforms. So that when I moved to California um, to get my graduate degree um, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to study. And it was these offshore oil platforms. I wanted to understand how um, they were impacting our oceans, both ne negatively and positively. And that's when I met Amber. Very cool. Yeah. So Emily and I met at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where we were getting our master's degree. And while it was uh, Emily's first time living in California, I am born and raised in Southern California. I 
got my undergraduate degree in marine science from UC Berkeley. And after I graduated, I was really passionate about communicating the value of a healthy ocean. So I went to work with Google on this special program called Google Ocean, where we take ideas and science and in science news and communicate them to the, and through the public, um, or excuse me, to the public really, through the portals in Google Earth and Google Maps. So one of our projects was we launched this thing called Underwater Street View, where you can virtually go in and dive along a coral reef and all these educational pop-ups come and talk to you about um, what a healthy coral should look like and where some of those uh, spots are around the world. So when I went down to Scripps for my master's and I met Emily and learned a little bit about this idea of rigs to reefs, I was like, well, you know, we actually have 27 offshore oil and gas platforms right off the coast of Santa Barbara. Could those be viable reefs? And if so, how could I ever communicate to my fellow peers, my Californians, we're a pretty green state where offshore oil and gas, you never think of them as um having any, anything to really do with a positive side of the environment. So I was really intrigued by the challenge of communicating that if it was viable habitat here in California. So Emily and I dove into a master's thesis project together, looking at the ecological, economic, and social implications of reefing platforms in California. And what we found is that these structures really are valuable habitats. Um, a published paper um, by the National Academy of Sciences back in 2014 found that they're some of the most productive habitats globally, more productive than mangroves or rainforests. They're really an incredible ecosystem. And you know what? We said, hey, well, in California, they're working. You know, they're these amazing ecosystems. But what about other platforms around the world? And from that, we formed Blue Latitudes, which is a women-owned marine environmental consulting firm. And we work around the world looking at offshore oil and gas platforms and helping operators determine on a case-by-case -case basis which ones would make viable reefs and which ones should be completely removed at the end of their economic lives. Wow, very cool. That's a great, uh, great overview. Thanks for the details, guys. So it sounds like in general, I mean, you both grew up somewhat attached to or associated with the water. I don't know if you, you both were like divers or surfers. Emily, I see a, a longboard up in your, in your rafters <laughs> yeah. behind you. Um, but like, obviously you had and felt some connection to the ocean and studied at Scripps together and then sort of just over time developed that idea based on some of your joint experiences and, and decided to officially launch in, tw when was that? In 20. 18, 2015. 15. Okay. I was way yeah. off. We started our nonprofit in 2018, but our for profit, we started in 2015. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I knew that there were also two wings there. And so I guess before we kind of dive into some of those details, just so that people have an understanding, right? I mean, do you know how many offshore oil platforms there are globally? There are hundreds. Well, yeah. It's hard to give an, any given number just because every single day a platform is being either built or decommissioned right. but in the gulf of mexico you know there's hundreds there's hundreds if not a over a thousand in southeast asia they're in every single ocean on the planet yeah and so the way that 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 works right is that oil and gas companies will get drilling permits they'll send rigs out and production facilities out they'll work that well for x number of years and then at at the end of life, when they decide that asset isn't viable anymore, they have to do something called decommissioning. Um, and so can you explain the decommissioning process a little bit and then where you guys come into play? Because obviously, I think that that's one of the main focal points of, of what you guys are doing in terms of assessing the viability of, of using the platforms for artificial reefs at the decommissioning phase of their of their life cycle. We both we can both explain it to you, but I'll give I'll give you my version of it, which is that yeah. I, when it when it does come time to decommission these structures, the process of decommissioning is the engineering feat of a lifetime. How do you remove a structure some the size of the Empire State Building from the seafloor? Many right. of these structures have been in the water column for decades and have 
So now you have this complication of these ecosystems that have developed on the beams and cross beams. So typically what's done is that the oil well itself is sealed and capped. And no matter what the oil company does with that platform jacket, the structure that's been supporting the drilling rig, the oil well itself is always going to be sealed and capped in the exact same way. And the oil companies actually retain liability for that well in perpetuity. So should there ever be a leak or spill or anything like that, they're always responsible. But the platform jacket where beams and cross beams where the marine life has been growing, that is traditionally completely removed through decommissioning. But through the rig reef process, it can be uh, repurposed as an artificial reef. They can sit down a below the water surface, allowing ships to sh safely draft over it, or they can topple it on its side or move it to an area of ecosystem need. And so those are some of the decommissioning options for reefing these structures. Okay, very cool. And so I guess that, you know, in general, traditionally, the cost associated with decommissioning a, a rig or a platform is probably millions of dollars, you know, per per rig, I would guess, right? Between like engineering costs, vessel time, removal, you know, personnel, everything along those lines. Easily, especially here in California. We have some of the oldest and the largest platforms in the world. They're easily millions of dollars. Yeah, cool. So in your experience with that then, I mean, as you guys approach some of the oil companies, I think that you know, in the industry and probably just in general, you know, there's always been a clash between, um, you know, crude oil production, for instance, and environmentalists, right? And so you guys are more or less environmentalists who are focused on improving the, the ocean ecosystems, but you're approaching oil companies, right, who may have different views. And ha has that been an issue or are you presenting a value add by um, saving them money through, you know, permitting and, and getting them to actually leave their rigs in the water? I mean, I think it's, it's definitely something that the oil companies um, have an awareness of, especially the operators that are working on the structures there. And, you know, the ROV operators, they see the crazy marine life every time they do an inspection. Um, and of course, an oil company saves a significant amount of money if they choose to reef. Um, it's upwards of 50% of the total cost of decommissioning that they would save. Um, wow. Of course, that cost savings is actually split with the oil company and stakeholders and the state. So there is a kickback and a benefit to the state for reefing, um, but they do still save a significant portion of the money. That being said, it's not always the best option to reef. Sometimes from an ecological perspective, it's not these reefs aren't, or these platforms aren't the best candidates. For example, if it was at the base of the Mississippi River, um, right. you know, you'd have a lot of erosion sediment runoff, which wouldn't foster a healthy marine ecosystem. However, in other cases, some of these platforms that might be close to shore and the price of scrap metal might be really high. So for them, taking it down, decommissioning it and selling the metal, they're gonna make more money. So for them, if it's a good option, it's typically platforms that are in a blue ocean setting. They're typically much, much larger structures, which is good for the ecosystem itself too. You know, if it's a platform the size of an Empire State Building, that's a massive ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so usually the types of platforms that we're looking at, um, they tend to, it's not all platforms. They fall into this kind of a smaller select group. Right. Okay. Very cool. And so just to backtrack for a second to try and like, frame the the problem you guys are trying to help solve. Um, can you give everyone a little bit more background on why the ocean, having a healthy ocean and those ocean ecosystems are so critical to our lives, you know, whether you're living in New York City or if you're living on the beach in, in San Diego um, and how that's really going to impact us moving forward as a, a global society? Well, the, our oceans, we like to say no blue, no green. They absolutely are such a critical part of what we do and how we live our lives. They provide, um, you know, not only an important protein source for many communities around the world, but they also provide a, a really important source of clean water. <laughs> I'm sorry, my son is 
with me right now because uh, my husband broke his foot, so he's gone. So please oh, ignore no, the little terrible. baby crying in the background. Don't don't but, worry about um, it at all. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, that I really think that having our healthy ha having a healthy ocean is critical to having a healthy life on land, and yeah. so that's why we do the work we do is to try and find ways to preserve and protect our oceans. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the biggest problems is, you know, when we talk to the guys over at Ocean Cleanup, for instance, you know, having the issue of pollution being so out of sight, out of mind to people like the ocean is this distant beast to so many people that you don't think about it when your trash ends up floating out there and how that trash then impacts the ecosystem. And it's all a closed cycle. It comes back to impact us too. Um, and so like with, with, converting rigs into reefs, I guess, and more specifically, you know, around the ocean ecosystem, why are reefs so important? Like what is the, what is the key to focusing on, on reef life and it globally, obviously not just in, in regional areas? Well, our reefs in general there, I mean, it's a massive habitat. It's a, it's a habitat type and it's not just reefs aren't just what you think of when you think of tropical waters although those are critically important you can have cold water reefs you can even have deep water reefs we see reefs with certain species of coral that extend down to a thousand feet where there is no sunlight these coral species don't need sunlight to survive um, and when you think about the destruction of any sort of habitat it's going to have far-reaching effects because there's thousands if not millions of species that rely on those reefs and I think the disconnect that sometimes occurs for folks is that, you know, it's not just the food that we eat that can be impacted by these ecosystems. So, you know, if you have plastic in the ocean and it's, it's broken down, you know, it becomes a microplastic and then that's consumed by a small organism, which is consumed by a fish. And then you might eat that fish. So you end up eating that plastic. There's that aspect of it. But our reefs and our oceans in general are responsible for our weather patterns. They're responsible for um, major sources of uh, uh, income for a lot of different countries, whether it's from fisheries, but also from different products that we harvest from our oceans. You know, seaweed itself is used in a ton of different types of food and toothpaste, ice cream, things like that. So our oceans are intrinsically tied to life on land and our reefs, especially because they are such a critical habitat. And what's unique about these reefs is that they provide hard substrate, meaning like a rocky surface. And in the ocean, hard substrate is actually relatively rare. It's not very common. So to create a habitat, it's like almost creating these oases in the middle of the ocean. And that's what these platform reefs do. It's, you know, they're in a blue ocean setting, providing hard substrate for a variety of species of fish, almost like, you know, an oasis in the desert. Right. So basically provide, you know, saving fish species that are probably slowly dying off due to the, the lack of, you know, available healthy reef ecosystems at this point. I mean, I know that the, in a lot of places around the world, like the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, is something that a lot of people probably have heard of at least, um, is, is, uh, has been dying for, for years. And, um, I think that there's a lot of efforts around the world to try and save reef life and reef ecosystems. And then also, you know, deploy artificial reefs with, with new material that's being put in the ocean. But what's so interesting is that because they're offshore, I think a lot of people don't really realize how many oil rigs are sitting out in deep water and how many of them actually aren't even in operation anymore. So, you know, having decommissioned oil rigs where we already have the material in the water to foster a reef or, you know, a, a new ecosystem is just really repurposing something that's already out there rather than even having to put something new in the water at all. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. And I think that uh, it's it's one of those critical things to try and get the general public to understand and have a relationship with because again it's that issue that I think we face with the ocean is things are out of sight out of mind but if you're you know someone who 
works in shipping or really any global economy, like 90% of our goods are delivered via ocean freight. And if you're just an ocean enthusiast or you like to ski in the mountains in the winter, like the weather patterns that our healthy oceans develop are, are going to impact your life too. So, um, yeah, I, exactly. I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess to, to kind of get back on the subject of, of blue latitudes and how, like what this process looks like for you guys. So as a, as a marine consultancy, right, there are thousands of rigs out there, hundreds of rigs out there at the very least, just in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, many of them are still drilling. Many of them are, are producing oil or, or gas. And some of them are, are completely have been out of operation for maybe years. What does the exact, like the process look like for you guys? So you identify potentially viable rigs, depending on maybe where they're located and, and what the water depth is and, you know, what their ecosystem looks like. And then you approach an oil company, I'm guessing, and, and you kind of start those conversations from there. Like, can you dive into that a little bit? Typically they come to us. We actually don't, don't seek them out and they come to us because they are nearing the end of of their economic life. They're having to think about what to do with these platform structures. And some of them are, you know, we like to say we deal with a lot of problem child um, projects because they're unique and they're looking for alternatives for decommissioning the sides, completely removing them from either the seafloor or from the water column. So we've worked on traditional fixed platform jackets those are, you know, that's what you would think of when you think of an offshore oil and gas platform. Yeah. We've also worked on floating structures. So more and more commonly your um, oil and gas is kind of moving away from that fixed platform uh, business model and really moving towards these floating facilities that allow them to reach deeper depths and resources in, you know, in the super deep sea. And we've also worked in the super deep sea, looking at these ecosystems that have formed on subsea infrastructure, infrastructure at 5,000, 8,000 feet water depth. So yeah. with that wide range, typically what we do is and it, we use remotely operated vehicles or, you know, like underwater drones to go down there and capture the marine life that's been developing on these structures. And from that footage, we can, we can characterize and quantify the marine life abundance and biodiversity that we see on those structures. And some of these studies are one-time studies. Some of them are over you know, the span of multiple years to look at how marine life has developed over time. And from that, we can understand what the value of that structure is as a reef and what, what benefit it brings to the local habitat. So that's, that's typically what we do. And um, we help our clients in, you know, in their pursuit of permits to reef. So in order to reef these structures, you've got to work with your regulators to get it approved. So that's another big part of the work that we do is, is educating and communicating to the regulators the value of these structures as reefs and, um, and doing the actual analysis ourselves. Very cool. And then so the, the permitting process, right? So I think Emily mentioned earlier that, um, you know, not only are you the work is the work that you guys are doing to, uh, to actually collect these permits or secure these permits and then reef a rig is, you know, not only going to the oil company in terms of cost savings from the decommissioning process, but also the states where or, or I guess the countries in some cases where those regions are, where those oil platforms are operating also get some form of a, a kickback as well. So I guess that gives you guys a pretty good position in terms of building value to all the stakeholders who are involved in that permitting or permit approval process, right? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. I, you know what something's interest an interesting part about dealing with regulators is that they are not you know it's their job to you know not only look out for the ecosystems and the environment but also for other relevant stakeholders and so that's um, you know as we've as we've grown as a business and developed these relationships we've learned more and more about what different stakeholders value with these reef ecosystems and how to address their needs when 
planning for decommissioning. So one good example we always like to give is commercial fishermen. You know, if you reef this structure for some fishermen, such as a trawl fisherman, which uses a net like a the size of a football field and drags it along the ocean floor, they don't want any obstacles in their way. So they're not looking for these platform structures to be left in place because it might cause an intrusion to their, their trawl fishing grounds. However, other fishermen may benefit from the habitat that these structures provide. And I, in the Gulf of Mexico, the platforms, they, you know, they've been studied for over 30 years and they've found that they've been significant contributors to the rebounding populations of red snapper, which is a really important co commercial fish out there. So in some cases, these platform habitats are really critical and important to fishermen. So what we do is we, we also look at these um, commercial fishing needs and re recreational fishing, how re reefing these structures would impact those stakeholders and present that to the regulators as well. So that's another um, a key part about working working with them and, and doing the permitting and trying to figure out that relationship is making sure that not only the environment is addressed, but other key stakeholders as well. Very cool. And yeah, I guess that it, it's a it's you know another interesting point with how many stakeholders are involved, you know, in terms of commercial fishermen too, because even if in some cases those commercial fishermen are kind of against the concept of having subsea structures, you know, if they're trawling with nets at the same time, if you, if we can't support more ecosystems then they probably are going to catch less fish, you know, over time. So, uh, it, it's, uh, I guess takes a lot of education and, and effort for you guys to really get involved with the right people and, uh, and actually push the, uh, push the concept on everyone. And so to date, I mean, how many projects have you guys been able to to actively work on or how many rigs have been converted or in the process of being converted into to artificial reefs? In the Gulf of Mexico, not us specifically, but they've already reefed between 500 and 600 platforms. Ah. Um, within that, sp that space, we've reefed probably at least 10 platforms in the Gulf. And then um, we've also worked on reefing multiple platforms worldwide from Malaysia to the Gulf of Thailand. Um, we've also worked on decommissioning projects in West Africa. Um, so we definitely see that this is quickly becoming an issue that's moving internationally. Or I shouldn't say an issue, but a movement almost that's moving um, quickly internationally, especially because as a society, we're moving away from petroleum as a principal source of energy. We're developing new types of energy, wave energy, wind energy, even geothermal energy. Um, and very quickly, the, the idea of an oil platform is becoming antiquated. So the structures that we have, they're aging. Um, and many, many, many countries are now recognizing we need to remove them. What's the most uh, financially savvy, environmentally savvy, socially savvy option that we have here and many, many times it is re uh, reaping those platforms. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good point in that, you know, we are working on alternative technology, obviously, and also specifically offshore technology to try and um, be more carbon neutral globally and trying to avoid, you know, crude if possible, or, or at least cut back. Um, you know, there's obviously a balance at the moment and we've seen a really big push in offshore wind. And just as Amber mentioned, you know, not just in fixed structures that are in shallow water, but also in deep water floating structures. So like from your, from your point of view, you know, as we make that transition towards more renewables offshore specifically, um, do you guys see an opportunity to integrate more artificial reefs and like it, it, within that the infrastructure of those projects like for floating wind farms or for more floating platforms like even if they're in operation and not not dying because i guess that you know even with offshore wind platforms or sorry offshore platforms that are still drilling um they're still as they're supporting reef life i, I guess right they're over time mm -hmm. turning into an, a living ecosystem yes yeah i mean Absolutely. And when we look at these offshore wind farms, one big consideration that I know that they've taken into account is when placing them, can we conduct 
citing studies to understand if these structures could not only be producing wind energy, but also perhaps contributing to the local ecosystem. Now that we understand how these structures can, you know, attract marine life and eventually form viable habitats. So that's something that they've been looking into, into incorporating into the business plan um, in terms of, yeah, doing these, these pre-development siting studies and looking to find that sweet, that sweet spot where they are, you know, not in vessel traffic uh, corridors. They're avoiding the, the bird corridors and whale corridors, but being placed in an area where they can provide, you know, habitat and also produce energy. Yeah. Very cool. And, and so I know that like for you guys, a, a big focal point has been education, right? I think one of the things we've talked about a few times now is the fact that so many people feel a disconnect between the ocean and not just the ocean, but also, you know, what is below. I mean, personally, I'm an ocean enthusiast. I work in the, in the industry. I surf, I kiteboard, I love everything about the water, but at the same time, you know, not everyone has been scuba diving or even snorkeling and they don't really see what things look like below the surface. And so how are you guys focused on education and trying to get the word out about, you know, why reefs are so important and how like someone like me or, or anyone else living around the world who might, you know, not fully understand to the same degree as you guys, what the impact is, um, what they can do to get involved. That's a great point that you're making. And I, I, it's not just an issue that affects the marine sciences. You know, it's the same thing that we see with space exploration. It's something that, although we do know more about the surface of the moon than we do know about the deep ocean, but it's so foreign to people. It can be kind of intimidating to people. There are people that have never even been in the ocean. So I think from that perspective, how do you get people to care about that? It's bringing it full circle, I think, and showing how everybody's daily lives are intrinsically linked to the oceans, but also sharing with them the visuals and sharing with them the science. And I think in general, that's an issue in the sciences where there's all this unbelievable research that's been coming out and coming out in publications, but no one can understand it. I mean, <laughs> so most, most people have not read a scientific journal in the last 10 years. We right. do a lot, but most people don't. And I think that's unfortunate because there's that's where all the information is. But that's also a fault on the sciences. How do you get that information out there and break it down for people to be able to understand? And that's starting to change. People are picking up new tools to be able to introduce the public to the sciences. Um, our nonprofit foundation is focusing on a community science initiative involving remotely operated vehicles so that we can take the public, no matter where you are, diving with us on these platforms and other artificial reefs in California to get them introduced to the marine life, introduced to technology and robotics, and really get people to care about our ocean resources. You know, seeing is believing. And I think when people see these ocean resources, they understand how intrinsically connected they are to our everyday lives. It starts to help close the loop for people and starts to help people care about our ocean resources. You know, 70% of our planet is ocean. So it's it's hard to ignore. And you start to realize that how deeply connected you are to that resource. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, when you talk, just like you said, a lot of people have never even gone in the ocean. I mean, a lot of people, even if they live near the ocean, think of it as this like scary place, right? And in many, in many ways, it certainly can be. I mean, like things happen on the ocean and it takes a lot of people's lives and there's a lot of big, scary looking, you know, fish that lurk below. But, um, you know, at the same time, it's so important to try and, and turn the page on that thought process and have a more open approach to like why it's so important and how it impacts all of us. So I think that, that that's really, that's really great. And I, I actually watched, um, yesterday morning, I watched the, the documentary you guys came out with from your trip to Malaysia, which was really interesting. And can you talk a little nice. bit about, about that, uh, that trip and kind of what it, what it meant for you guys and what the significance was? Yeah. So, so we traveled to, to Borneo 
And our purpose was to dive on an oil platform that had been repurposed for ecotourism to understand how that reef ecosystem was impacted by not only the tourism that surrounded it, but how did it relate and perhaps contribute to the nearby natural reefs? So we did, um, we conducted some scientific surveys on the legs of that platform jacket, as well as on the surrounding reef eco ecosystems to try, try and quantify that. And, and what we found is that, um, you know, the structure was not as we expected. We were used to diving on the oil platforms in California that are covered in life. And it's unmistakable, the reef ecosystems that, that have formed and grown there and the value of those, those reefs. But in Malaysia, this was a totally different environment and a different platform. It was a jackup rig. So it it only had four or maybe six legs, no beams or cross beams that intersected to form all those nooks and crannies that create the complexity that attracts marine life. The other issue was that it was off the island of Mabul, which is famous for its muck diving. So it's a very sedimented environment that is not going to have the same, you know, vibrant corals that are attracted to rocky outcrops. And because of that, you know, these structures, they mimic the environment in which they've been placed, as do all artificial reefs. And so it was mimicking what was in its surrounding, this mucky water environment. So the marine growth, the invertebrate growth on the on those six legs was relatively sparse. And, you know, there were a lot of fish that were congregating amongst the beams, probably for feeding purposes or for shelter. But there was no permanent, um, you know, established reef fishes associated with, with that structure. So what we really took away from this trip is the importance of a siting study that not every oil platform is a good candidate to be reef. You really have to look at the environment in which it's been placed, the structure, how complex is that structure? How long has it been in the water column? And these are all important factors that help determine which reefs would, or excuse me, which platforms would make, uh, you know, good reef candidates. And, um, you know, it was a really interesting trip for us. We we did take the film crew with us to to capture it. And I think the long lasting and kind of the big takeaway point for us is that not only was this an important trip, but it it helped us to talk about these platforms around the world and and bring that video footage home so that we could share it with with others and I, you, I'm sure you noticed at the end, we kind of turned the conversation towards California and what's happening here in terms of decommissioning. And yeah. it gave us that platform to really shine a spotlight on, on the rigs to reef opportunities and challenges in California. So, um, you know, we were really grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, no, I thought that I thought, I, I mean, I kind of got that exact message out of it. So I guess that it was very well done. Um, <laughs> Good. The, the one thing that I was really curious about, and, and I think that it's obviously a case to case basis, right? But I mean, are there, are there instances where the rigs uh, are actually providing even more viable habitats for, for like these ecosystems than like a, a naturally occurring reef? Well, I mean, I think if you had a pristine reef and you compared it to an offshore oil platform, my vote would always be for the pristine reef. It's a natural system. It's a closed loop system. And, you know, the only challenge with these oil platforms is that we don't really know what's going to happen to these structures a thousand years from now. We don't know how they're going to break down. Um, our best estimate is, you know, 500 to 1,000 years, we'd maybe start to see some breakdown of the structure, which is granted a long time. Um, mm. But with the natural system, of course, it's made in nature. It's made to be there. It's made to, you know, last in nature. Um, that being said, these platforms are excellent candidates for reefs. They're made out of galvanized steel, which is extremely strong, strong metal. Um, and it's designed to last for a long, long time, unlike many other examples of reefs, such as shipwrecks, 
which mm. aren't always the best candidates for artificial reefs because sometimes they're made out of materials that weren't meant to be degrade they degrade more easily in the ocean so i think if i had to choose of course i'd, I'd want to choose a natural reef but our offshore oil and gas platforms are supplementing those natural reefs in a really healthy and positive way yeah very cool and so just to to backtrack for another minute here amber i want to get your perspective i know that you you in an earlier life worked at google as you mentioned earlier trying to kind of do with a similar mission of trying to make you know the ocean and the importance of the ocean maybe more accessible to the general public uh similar to the way that we use google maps now in our everyday lives at least most people do um do you do you see that initiatives from large corporations like Google um, will will continue to play a role and need to play more of a role in outreach, education, partnering with organizations like Blue Latitudes to try and make that difference and, and truly make an impact? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's an incredibly important thing. Uh, it's incredibly important for big corporations to get involved in conservation and especially in conservation of our ocean. You know, the only reason why Google started to do anything in the oceans is because they were kind of challenged in a TED talk that given by Dr. Sylvia Earle. She said she uh, was talking to the to the founder of um, or the developer or something for the Google Google Earth. And at the time, Google Earth was, you know, you could, you could see different topography and stuff on land, but the ocean was just a blank blue surface. And she said, how could you be ignoring 70% of our planet? And the truth is, is that most people are more concerned with terrestrial environments. And so they had ignored the ocean. And on top of that, we actually don't even really have the topography of a significant portion of our oceans. It's unexplored, unmapped. And so we didn't have the data, so we didn't show it. Nobody cared. And Dr. Sylvia Earle, who has a lot of, a lot of spunk and a lot of uh, meaning to her words, said, you know, this is something that to take on. And so Google, Google did. And they started a map ocean floor and you know they work with big satellite companies nasa uh, scripps institution of oceanography uh, where else um usgs to gather this data to try and piece together what the topography of the ocean floor like one small piece to the bigger question of how do we conserve our uh, how do we conserve our oceans and how do we protect them? And Google was ad addressing that one small part and, and, you know, doing what they could as a corporation to try and provide this information to the general public. The general public could learn more and care because when they care about the oceans, then they're more likely to want to protect them. Mm. And so each corporation out, I mean, many other corporations out there might play a different role. And I think it's, their responsibility to identify what that role could be and then put it into action. And if all corporations and companies, big companies try and participate in their own small way, hopefully we can get a, you know, greater force behind this ocean conservation initiative and, and the education of, of public to, to care about our oceans. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. And uh, something I'd like to get both of your opinions on is, you know, why in your opinion, you know, in your mind over the years, you know, there's been so much emphasis, obviously, and, and money placed behind exploring other planets, right? Um, why do you think that the ocean has been kind of left behind compared to some of those other exploration efforts that are, you know, in other, in other parts of our universe versus more than half of the planet that's sitting right in front of us? Well, I think people think it's going to be easier to live on other planets <laughs> than it is to be living underwater. There has yeah. been numerous failed, ex well, not failed, but there's been numerous attempts to create underwater living quarters and for people to go underwater and live for days at a time. And it's challenging. It, we're not, humans are not adapted to live underwater for long periods of time. Um, yeah. And I think 
people are very quickly to dismiss the planet that we're on in hopes of moving to other planets in the future, you know, thinking that we've depleted our planet, let's move to a new one. Um, you know, that being said, I, I'm always so sad about the lack of funding that's gone into the space program. I think that exploration is what motivates human spirit and to see programs like the space exploration and like marine science not get the funding they deserve just because it seems out of reach or out of touch is hard to witness because I think they are really important. But I think what it comes down to it is, you know, the deep sea is an unforgiving place. You get thousands and thousands of pounds of pressure and it's not easy. The ocean's also extremely corrosive. So, you know, it's like we're looking into space exploration, trying to scout out a new planet, mostly so that we could live there and figure out how we could habitate those habitat, those habitate. What's the word? I don't know, actually. That's a good <laughs> like question. Like live on those planets. <laughs> <laughs> I said that and I was like, I don't know. Inhabit. Right. Inhabit. No. <laughs> Inhabit. That's the word. Inhabit. Yeah. Inhabit. Uh, <laughs> Inhabit those planets. And the ones that are more, um, you know, unforgiving in terms of conditions are the ones we're not really investigating, you know? So I think that's, that is a big reason why we've moved away from the ocean exploration. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really a, is a, an amazing problem. And the, you know, we work with a couple of different companies who have kind of taken their backgrounds from space exploration and engineering, you know, and, and really the, the rocket and, and satellite worlds to, the ocean and uh, starting, you know, subsea vehicle companies. And th I think in many cases, they say that it's actually more challenging to design, um, you know, systems that are operating subsea than it is to send something into outer space just because of, of how unforgiving it is. So yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. See how it all evolves. Um, well, I know that we're kind of we're coming up on time here, but I wanted to ask you guys two other, you know, relatively quick questions about your experience with Blue Latitudes and then also the foundation. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is key to us growing the blue economy is obviously shedding light on some of the opportunities and maybe entrepreneurial opportunities as well that the space holds. Um, for you guys as founders, you know, what has been the the hardest thing to overcome and maybe the most rewarding thing about starting blue latitudes um and and what like really gets you excited every day that's a good question gosh i would say that every day is a there is a new challenge and i think that those challenges are actually keep me coming back i love to to solve these problems and solve these issues that make our company run. Um, I also think that because we have a, a greater purpose that we're working towards, it helps us stay focused and align on what we're doing. And, and that's why we started the Blue Latitudes Foundation is because so much of our work in consulting was education, outreach, and research and exploration. Those were all things that just didn't really fall underneath this for-profit business. And so it's what, you know, because we were heading in the, you know, in that direction, we decided to start the foundation to accommodate those efforts that we were making. And, you know, it's, I, I really feel fulfilled by the work that we do and it's exciting to come back to it every day. Great. What about you, Emily? Yeah, I really agree with Amber. I mean, I think the, the most challenging thing about starting a business is there's not a book that they can give you that's like, here's how to start a business. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and we're both got our degrees in the sciences, not we don't have a background in business. So yeah, I would say maybe we the have funny a funny thing is that they, they do a make second. books. <laughs> they do make books for that, but then they're not very helpful. <laughs> they don't really tell you what. Yeah, they're like the for general, in things. general, how to start a business for dummies. Yeah. 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 But like but when you doesn't. think about like the specific problems that your business might face, it's hard, you know, and I, you know, both of us have parents that have worked in a variety of businesses and in, um, avenues for entrepreneurship, but specifically to a marine environmental consulting, 
that's challenging. <laughs> and, you know, I think both of us have a second degree in Google, which is just Googling everything, you know, and every time you, you get a notice in the mail, you're like, what does this mean? Like, what is this tax code? I don't know what this is. And sometimes I kind of like that for the same reason that Amber was saying is like, I love the marine sciences. I love that I get to spend my days working in the marine sciences, but I also love that I get challenged in this field of business. It's something I didn't know about. It's something I've been learning about and to learn every day in both spaces is both exciting and fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, it's, it's great that you guys get to learn, you know, not only probably daily more about the ocean because there's so much that's unknown, but also you're, you're on a, a business journey. So I'm sure you learn new things in that front as well on a daily basis. Um, what, I mean, for you, for you guys with Blue Latitudes, I mean, where do you go from here? Like what, what's in store the next five, 10, 15 years as, you know, some of these rigs start to get reefed. And then, uh, you know, beyond that, we look at a really, a, a, the start of a renewables transition uh, offshore as well. Like what, how do you guys adapt and, and where do you go? Where do you see yourself ending up? Well, we've, we've kind of touched on starting to explore more into offshore wind or these other industries that are using our environment and, and, you know, what is their impact? Has it been quantified? Is there a way to work with that, with those industries offshore to, you know, maybe have a positive impact on our environment. It's kind of like with the offshore wind, I was talking about the siting studies before they even put them in. Can we say what, we look at what we've learned from oil and gas and say these structures could be viable habitats. Let's think before we put in offshore wind and try and site them in areas where the structures will benefit the local ecosystem. So I, I really see that as kind of the future of some of the work that we're doing. And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're excited about it. it keeps us coming back. Yeah, no, I think that it's it's uh, it's going to be really fun to follow along. I think there's a lot of exciting new ventures out there, and I think now more than ever, you know, luckily in, there's more of a connection being made to the ocean and the importance of the ocean. So, you know, just from my perspective, I mean, I went scuba diving for the first time this year, actually, and uh, it of all my time spent in the ocean. It was a, it was really an amazing experience. And if you ever have the chance to do it to anyone, anyone listening, I'm sure you guys agree. I mean, that really is a, it can be probably life-changing for a lot of people to really see not just, you know, what's on the surface, but what is below and, and why it, it is so important and, and cool. Um, and I think it really does a lot to change perspectives. So it, how can, how can people Definitely. follow how can people follow along with you guys as we, and, and, you know, we'll definitely keep everyone updated, but what's the best way to stay in the loop with everything you're, you're doing and um, will be doing in the future. You can follow along with us on social media. We have an Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at blue attitudes foundation. And you can also follow along uh, with our adventures on our YouTube channel, science CTV where we take you on some of our research expeditions and also interview other women scientists in the marine uh, fields. And then you can also check out our websites at rigtoreefexploration.org and bluelatitudesfoundation.org. Cool. Well, we'll we will uh, link all of that in our, in our show notes when this actually does end up getting released in the coming weeks. And hopefully we can have you guys back on again. I mean, I, I think it's it's really interesting to talk about. And I, I think it's a very cool intersection of some of the things that I get to work on and, and uh, also some of the things that I just personally enjoyed doing in life. So I'm looking forward to, to following along myself. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. It's been a fun discussion. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm glad you guys, guys enjoyed it. Thanks again to Emily and Amber for joining me on the show today. It was a pleasure having them on and we are super excited to follow along with all of their progress in the months to come. If you're interested in learning more about Blue Latitudes or supporting the foundation, we suggest that you check out their website at rigtoreefexploration.org and bluelatitudesfoundation.org, both linked in the description of this podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Other 70% with Nortech. 
As always, we are looking for new ways to bring together those with an interest in our blue planet. Tune in again later this month to hear more from inspiring entrepreneurs, technologists, and activists who are building the blue vision for the future. I'm Nevin DiParlo, and we will see you next time.